For those of you who have just joined us after closed session, I'm Jeff Connell, board president. I'd like to introduce my fellow trustees, Marie Haug, Lisa Pelosi, Jeannie Kerr, Julio Ogin. Also joining us tonight is Joe Browdy. Thank you for being here tonight. Also I'd like to introduce our excellent district staff, chief business official and acting superintendent, Ms. Andy Stubbs, chief academic human resources officer, Mr. Christopher Heller, executive assistant, superintendent, governing board, Ms. Erica Madrigal, Executive Assistant to the Chief Academic Officer, Ms. Melissa Hanson. Thank you again, guys, for being here. Uh, we are delighted you're here this evening or in person uh, or viewing us on Channel 27 or on our YouTube channel. A copy of the board meeting video will also be available at our website, www.sinlinunified.org. In connection with items A, B, and C in closed session, the board received information and uh, provided staff with direction. Please join me again for the flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This brings us to item number 6A, which is public comment on open session items. Anybody wish to comment on an agenda item that is excuse me, on an item that we are not having tonight. Okay, that takes us to presentations, uh, which is a board member report. Um, tonight, oops, the uh, board member report is a written report. Is there any public comment or questions on this report? Trustees, any comments or questions on this report? I just had, I noticed a typo in my, when I submitted it. It's supposed to be uh, the subitize that uh, Principal Sanguinetti talked about earlier, and I, I obviously didn't catch it, so that okay. would be my only correction in that. Okay, great. Thank you for giving us the report. We're on to item 7D, 7B, which is presentation by the uh, student board representative, Mr. Joe Browdy, please. Alrighty. Let's get right into it. So um, as President Connell said, this is the student representative report for the month of October, also coupling it in because um, of the recent events in October. Um, and then again, my name is Joe Brady. We will be going down the school, starting at the high school, and then descending by grade level, ending with the primary school. So starting off, um, been very exciting times at the high school. First and foremost, it was homecoming week. This year's theme was seasons, so each class chose a season. We had the freshman class with summer, the sophomore class, spring, the junior class, fall, and the seniors were winter. Um, I have a little quick pick um, of all of the floats going down the parade that was right um, on the corner of Main Street right there, right where our judges were. Um, I have to extend my congratulations to the junior class who were the winners of this year's uh, float competition. But you know, all the classes did a beautiful job. And homecoming week this year was October 21st with the Powder Puff game on the 24th and the homecoming parading game on the 25th. Moving on, another really awesome program at the high school. Uh, we had our first student congress meeting. Uh, student congress is a formal student body uh, that gives students the opportunity to grapple with and really resolve some really important school climate issues. Um, aligning with the district's focus, the focus of Student Congress is equity. And Student Congress is a really unique group on campus because um, it's students from all across the school. So we ask each fourth period to send one representative. Um, we end up with a really nice, a really diverse group of students. So as you can see, we have 21 students and the goal, really the official goal of Student Congress is to bring together a diverse group of students to brainstorm storm and implement strategies to create a social and academic environment where every student can thrive. Um, and so it's really just creating a space for all discussion to be brought forward, really emphasizing um, every idea is a good idea when it really comes down to students and student success. Moving on, it was also a very exciting time for the Performing Arts Department here at the high school. Always super happy to report on that. Um, St. Helena Jama had a very successful run of the Laramie Project. A cast of 35 and a crew of 15 students uh, worked to put on the Laramie Project, which is um, a show about the town of Laramie after the death of Matthew Shepard, so really dealing with their reaction and really focusing on the town's interchanging dynamics, very similar to our small town community. 
Uh, and it also was the first year that a student has ever directed the piece. So it was directed by Miss Sophia Osborne, who is a senior this year. Moving right along, we have the St. Helena Chamber Choir participated in the third annual acapella festival. So they worked with other ensembles from the community to put on a really amazing show. They were also joined by the House Jacks, which is a professional acapella group. So that was super exciting to see. And then the St. Helena Band, um, under the new direction of Miss Fulmer, they had their first concert partnered with the community band, and it was an ensemble of high school and RLS students coming together to work with the community band. Moving right along down the chain, we made it to the RLS Middle School. Some really interesting things to report on. They had their student council elections, uh, which was super exciting. So all of their officers were voted in. And then another super special thing is they have a leadership class, full-fledged leadership class at the RLS, really focusing on student leadership and leadership skills, which is super exciting. And then student council, just going back a little bit, is joined by representatives of each family group on campus. So family groups are students that are grouped together, um, regardless of grade level, it's a mix of students with one teacher. They meet discuss student going ons and then those representatives bring that to student council to create nice positive change we also another great program at the lrls is the safe school ambassador program which is all about preventing and recognizing bullying in its various forms um, students go through a two-day training to really evaluate what is bullying how um, it can be really systemic in schools how it comes about in schools and some really great strategies to end it and prevent it from happening again so that's super exciting to report it and then you can also see there's a nice picture there of the student-wide art project that was put on at the beginning of the year by Miss Kay, who's the art director at the RLS. They are um, self-portraits, uh, much more abstract for those like myself who are less artistically inclined, which is always appreciated. Um, so you can see some beautiful portraits put on by the students. Moving on to the elementary school, lots of also always exciting stuff to report. Um, so one thing I was super excited to hear from Mrs. Pearson was the walk and roll to school initiative that's really being bolstered and brought about at the um, elementary school. And so students every Wednesday are encouraged to walk or roll to school. Um, and it's really focusing on healthy living and reducing one's impact. And another, it's really um, nicely incentivized. The class with the highest participation gets a nice little prize. So that's always exciting. And I also learned that each Wednesday is given a new theme. Uh, so there is a dress up theme, um, a partnership theme to really get more students involved, which is super awesome. They also have their student leadership. Uh, so fifth graders are given the opportunity to run for student council. They present a short little speech to a group of third and fourth graders um, to really emphasize that the student council works for the students. Um, it's not just this cool club that you get to be a part of. You're really doing good work to benefit all students on the campus. Finally, we move on down to the primary school. This was one of the biggest things. There has been a beautiful new playground installed. Very exciting to see. Um, I met with Mrs. Sanguinetti before it was opened, so it's nice to see one of the things that we talked about was that nice astroturf there. Always if they have a little for a soft landing in case anything goes wrong. Um, they also, this is the first time that a playground at the elementary school has had monkey bars. Students were ecstatic there was going to be monkey bars, so it was super excited to see. It also has balance beam, spinner, a bunch of really fun stuff. And then I also would like to report on one thing that we touched earlier in the board study session. This community circle in which students start their day together with their teacher. And it's really just, how do I learn how do I feel confident being myself? Also focusing on analyzing emotions, understanding emotions, where do they come from? How can I understand my own emotions? And then how do I translate that when working with others? Which is super exciting to see. I um, met with a seventh grade, a seventh, a second, a second grade student, excuse me. And we were talking about the community circle and he just, I was like, so what do you do in the community circle? And he just went off and like, this is how I know I'm feeling angry. This is how I know I'm feeling happy. And sometimes my sister makes me mad. And so it was really nice for stu to see students really engaging with what they're learning in their community circle.
moving on again. More exciting stuff happening at the primary school. Uh, they, 12 primary school students were actually brought over to the high school to work with the advanced AutoCAD class, um, and they built toolboxes. I was able to sit in on that field trip. Super exciting to see students working together. And the, uh, I know the high school students had an amazing time, and it really looked like the primary school students were learning a lot. So it was great to see that involvement um, across the schools, which is super exciting. And then another cross-school involvement activity was also the primary patch, uh, the pumpkin patch primary day. Wow, alliteration is really just going off in that title. Um, and then all kindergarten students were invited to the pumpkin patch, which is put on by the high school ag students off the Silverado Trail. Um, they were split up into five groups, um, five different exercises. There was uh, pumpkin story time. There was actually, we had, we set out pumpkins for all the students to pick their own to bring home to carve for Halloween. We also had life cycle coloring, just talking about life cycle of plants, growing organisms, and then we also had an awesome petting zoo. We had two pygmy goats and a rabbit that were provided by high school students, which was super exciting. And then just um, connecting back to the high school, the pumpkin patch was open every weekend in October. Um, manned staff really run by students that had been uh, growing those pumpkins on that site. There's a three acre uh, plot of land that was donated by Joseph Phelps for the students to use. So they were out there all summer working and the pumpkin patch um, was open all of October, very successful. Um, and now just if there are any questions um, on student activities, anything like that. I don't have any questions, but I don't know if anybody's noticed in the format of our agendas now, superintendent used to follow the student report. And I think I now know why it's much later. In the <laughs> Very nice job. Joe and, and I think you're also a junior as well coincidentally and you know it just happened that way that the oh, junior okay, class that you won the float contest okay I just wanted to make sure that I got that right just happened okay good <laughs> but no I definitely have to hand it to all of the students um, especially here at the high school it was amazing homecoming week um, we had some really healthy competition between the classes which was super exciting to see and then culminating in a great football game and a powder puff game that was and actually a exciting. Powder puff game, which was super exciting. Um, Brandon, I mean, there was like actually catches made out there. I know <laughs> it was. It was yes, yes. They said it was um, one of the more eventful powder puff games right, yeah, uh, in like terms of good. plays and touchdowns. So it was super exciting to see and a really great time at the high school, especially. Super fun. Thank you for sharing. May I, and Joe, Please. you you deserve a plug for the Laramie project as well. I noticed that you left your name off of that, but um you were the assistant director and, and an instrumental part to the success of that show. So congratulations. Thank you. We are on to item number uh 8A, which is a request to accept gifts and donations uh earmarked funds. Uh at this point, I'd ask uh, Trustee how if you could please read the uh, donations. This so um, first, we have two hundred fifty dollars, Maria Haug, two thousand nineteen scholarships, five hundred dollars from the Community Foundation, two thousand nineteen scholarships, one thousand dollars for from the Community Foundation for two thousand nineteen scholarships, two thousand dollars from the Community Foundation, two thousand nineteen scholarships, five thousand dollars from Bailey Cummings family for 2019 scholarships, $59,500 from the Community Foundation for 2019 scholarships, $84,116 from Anonymous for 2019 scholarships, Five, $50 from Elmer and Cheryl Harris for athletics, $50 from David Toon, athletics, $100 from Thomas Thurmond, athletics, $100 from Cat Patty Garbage, Garbrich for athletics, $100 from Nancy Clift for athletics, $20 from Jennifer Smith from band, $20 from Michael Kellogg for band, $20 for Diana Slanian for band, $100 from Maria Erickson for drama, $2,000 for the St. Helena Ag Boosters for FFA General Fund, $1,000 from St. Helena Fire De Volunteer Fire Department for football, $11,250 from the Saints Athletic Associations for SHS sports programs, $1,300 from Ogletrees for the varsity volleyball team, $192 from Athletic Feet Incorporated for the cross country team. Wow. 
Uh, is there anyone present who wishes to publicly comment on any of this agenda item? Trustees, any questions or comments on this agenda item? Uh, Joe is a uh, student representative of the board. Uh, you may cast preferential votes on all matters except personnel and those subject to closed session items. So uh, is there a motion to accept the donations, gifts, or earmarked fund as presented? I'll make that motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Joe, please cast your preferential. Uh, preferential. <laughs> preferential. Preferential. I'll get it right in the next one. Preferential vote. Aye. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. Motion is carried. We are on to item 8B, which is District of Choice Report 2019-2020. Uh, Ms. Andy Stubbs, please. Thank you. And this is a, a discussion information item. Uh, the purpose of the District of Choice Report at this time is to update the board and the community with information about the program. And so the report begins with some background information that describes how the program began. Uh, and then if we look down at the table below that, we received 84 applications and the report shows the grade level breakdown as you can see. Uh, and then the next table shows our enrollment caps for 2019-20. And then uh, in January 2018, the board conducted the official District of Choice lottery. And then the next table shows the District of Choice spots that were granted and accepted for the 2019 school year. Uh, and then with new residential enrollments since January, it's put our enrollment total for this year at uh, 1242. And then the final page of the report shows additional details on demographics for students that are in the District of Choice program. And then I'd like to go back up if I could and talk about the enrollment caps very briefly. Uh, so in the 2018-19 school year, we had a large District of Choice enrollment in kindergarten, and then a number of families moved into the district, and the kindergarten class grew quite large. And so when they moved into first grade this year, we added a teacher. Uh, and then you may notice, uh, we've talked about this in the past, we've kept the high school enrollment caps lower because of the unknowns with students coming from uh, Hal Mountain uh, Elementary School District and then Pope Valley. And so we haven't in the past looked at the kinder enrollment caps, but now we're considering decreasing them so that we can manage enrollment in the, at those grade levels better. Uh, and then Dr. Wilson is working with the principals to have, um, with the principal of the primary school to have families enroll resident kinder sooner with an earlier deadline that's going to help us manage those caps. Um, and the plan is to likely decrease those and then during the December board meeting Dr. Wilson will bring some information about that to the board. And so President Conwell, if you could please at this time lead a discussion about the enrollment caps. Sure. Uh, first of all, is there anyone uh, present who wishes to publicly comment on this agenda item? Trustees. So I think you guys are all familiar with this, or what happened where we had to hire another teacher uh, for first grade this year, is that correct? Ms. Correct, Stubbs? yes. Yeah. So to our bubble, and uh, as you know, it, it kind of came from this situation where we had our cap at 75, and May 15th, is that the date with the first look date when people can apply? There's a date. I don't know when it is, but it's early. It's much earlier than when school starts, when okay. that we can fill people from out of town. Mm -hmm. And so the, the wondering what the board's feeling is of lowering the kinder target from 75 to a, to a significantly lower number to keep from having uh, out of district basically to have the same issue happen again which would be to we'd have to hire another teacher when they become first grade if we get because the last uh, we got I believe it was 18 applicants for kinder this last year right there yeah there it is 18 of them and 14 of them accept a spot so it's so what happens is by the time our local students enroll, that then puts us in a crunch time with our teachers and class sizes to keep them the same. So wondering what uh, board, how the board feels about a reduction in kinder uh, for to fill 
uh, earlier on, and I believe that there is the opportunity to raise that number later in that same year. So ideally we can, we can have our cap be 50 and then we can turn around two weeks into school, I believe, and we can raise it to 75 to fill if there's slots available. Okay. So, just, so the idea is is to keep us from hopefully having a bubble year of of right. of students that are not that don't live in the district. Obviously, if they all live in the district, then we have a bubble, and that's what we do. Then we right. hire a teacher, and we move on. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so I'm just curious what everybody's thoughts are. Is cool. fifty the being the proposed number, or is that just? I just that's a Jeffism. Out? Okay. I just made it okay. up into. Okay. It's got to be low. Mm -hmm because otherwise you'd run into the same problem. You can't just drop it by five right. or 10. Sure. It's gotta be something significantly low okay. so that. Would having the, the deadline application for May 15th and hopefully having more students apply, or local students apply then, and knowing how many of our local students that we have coming in, would that help? I mean, would that help mitigate as far as that big bubble at the end? I mean, to get the applications in earlier? so like because uh, normally because a lot of families sometimes might wait till the very end to like almost past the summer and into the school right at the beginning of the school year so we kind of don't know and and if they're local students i assume we have to they have to be here so correct yeah if and we so, were to be able to kind of get the families that are local and kind of get a better idea of how many students would, uh, i mean they would and then, I, then we could set the the cap i, I guess Yes, and so Dr. Wilson's been working with um, Principal Sanguinetti at the primary school to have that date uh, begin earlier in the year. So that deadline for residents. Will you please come to the mic? Thanks. Um, so um, historically, we haven't really had a um, a hard deadline you know it's kind of been um, basically we started having some tours in April and then people would register in May but we never said you know this is the date so dr. Wilson and I have spoken about that we're gonna start um, we're gonna start blasting this out in January and hopefully by March 1st is what we're what we were our target date was is to to really and then to I normally go and visit the preschools and talk to them and get it in the paper and um, so start having tours in January and February and um, then I mean we can't we can say March but obviously people can what we had is over the summer we had a significant number of families that moved into St. Helena it's, you know more than we've ever had and so that's what it's like wow this is really getting to be kind of a little bit out of control so it was an unusual year but I think if we move the cut date to like March 1st then we're going to be able to have a better idea and let people know that that's our deadline. I mean, we're going to say that, but again, there'll be people that might, you know, come after that time to want to register as well. And also, I think I heard something about um, having somewhat of a day on that deadline, which is a registration fair, similar to what was done for the um, for the district wide um, uh, residency registration form fair. Um, I don't think that's been discussed at this time to have something similar we most certainly can I think that maybe Julio was talking about something like that for his preschool for all but um, we will have the registration fair again next year uh, but mostly that's to accommodate returning students and there you know and with kindergartners and TKs you know that they're this time and as they enter the system would need to provide two sets of residency verification when they register and then you know if they register in may then we ask them over the summer to do it as well correct erica yeah yes that's correct mm -hmm. yeah and then one more question um also um considering that we're already over cap for tk and all those students would uh, um, logically be attending our kindergarten mm -hmm. 
um, I, I see that as a further indication that um, we should be decreasing that cap. Um, may I make a comment about that? Um, so currently we, we had another student um, come, so we have 17, and we are projecting um, with the the students turning six, or excuse me, five over the December, January, right. we're anticipating for sure to have um, five more students in TK. So that would bring the numbers up TK to 23. In, a TK, in, one, TK. in one TK class. She, the, that teacher does have a full-time instructor, the paraprofessional in the classroom. Okay. Yeah, I would, I mean, I personally think just from a business management standpoint, having a firm deadline, you know, is super beneficial because then it allows the district time to plan accordingly and get, and then you said, I would imagine between you and Dr. Wilson and the, other, the rest of the staff, then they get an idea from all the preschools, the potential number coming in as well. Right, right. Okay. And there, there are some specific preschools that ask me to come and come to one of their parent meeting nights. So I go and, you know, and then um, at the uh, Julio's meeting, um, preschool for all meeting, I come and we talk about it. And I think we, we talked about like, you know, actually having that time to sit down and um, help them with their registration packets as okay. well. Okay. And the, um, I, we could reach out to the um, uh, Napa County preschools that have students that, that are in our district but are going to the Napa County preschools that um, they don't normally have their transitional IEPs until May or June, but I could certainly get contact to them directly to get the numbers that, that we have for them. I'm just, um, with all of this in mind, I think that it's, it's, it would be who of us to, to decrease those, the enrollment down at, T at kindergarten. Um, I'm not sure what the magic number is, and I don't think any of us do, you know, but um, I think that it would be helpful if we did that just so we don't have the same challenge that we had this year um, as far as the number of students. Cause, and, and with our District of Choice um, students, as we know, once they're in our district, they're in for the entire time. So this one, it's, it's going to continue throughout each of the grades, which is fine. But we just have to be prepared for that. Yeah. Yeah, and of course, you know, the other thing is, is we can mandate and say whatever date we want everybody to know. But the thing is, they can show up the day of exactly. school, and exactly. if they live in our district, they're going to be part of our students, and we're going to welcome them, welcome them. So I mean, it's, you know, it's uh, so uh, okay. So I'm, I'm just, uh, so trust. I've heard two trustees are comfortable in lowering that uh, in lowering that. Yeah, I'm comfortable as well. I, and I like I personally like the the that we, if you will, reserve the right that if we have to make adjustments, we we can still do that. I mean, right. if we get to, you know, have to increase it or, right. you know, that we are keeping that ability to do that. That's I like that option. I agree with that as well. Right. Yeah, I feel comfortable with that. As okay. Well. Can I, can I just ask one question? Uh, how many kindergartners w did we have per class before we got the extra teacher? We were at uh, well over 20, right? It, are you speaking about first grade this year? First grade this yes. year. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. We, we All of the classes had over 20 in them. Okay. They were up, I think there were some that were 24. And we 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 really have put a priority at small class sizes at right. the primary school. And, so and I, again, this was just a very unusual situation in which a significant number of um, families moved into St. Helena with children. Okay, I, I think we got enough information to continue. So thank you, everybody, for your for your responses. I appreciate that. We are on to item number uh, 8C, which is a request for approval of revised St. Helena Unified School District Governance Handbook. Uh, well, this is on me. And um, so uh, what we did is, I believe, uh, under superintendent evaluation, we we have an updated version on the board. And uh, we have rewritten basically the rules for our board when we evaluate the superintendent and uh so uh with that let me ask is there any public comment on this agenda item trustees any questions or comments concerning this agenda item okay 
Is there a motion to approve the revision to the Signaling Unified Governance Handbook as presented? I'll make that motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Joe, please cast your preferential vote. Aye. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The motion is carried. We are on to item number nine under student learning and achievement. This is a report on the 2019 2020 local control accountability plan, LCAP district goals and actions. This is a written report. So is there anyone who wishes to publicly comment on this agenda item? Trustees, any questions or comments on this agenda item? No, I didn't have any. Uh, I'll just say thank you, Mr. Heller, for, the, for that. I appreciate the, the written report. On to item number 9B, uh, which is consideration of approval for the 2019-2020 English Learner Master Plan. Ms. Mary Allen. <laughs> Good evening again. We've had a lot of data today, but we're, I'm going to go through a little bit more data, but not a lot. Um, just bringing up the EL Master Plan, our English Language Learner Master Plan for the district, and what do we do at all of our sites related to helping our students require English as quickly as possible. As we know, uh, language acquisition usually takes five to seven years, and this is just our plan of when a student comes in and speaks a language other than English, what is, uh, what's, our, what's the form that we use as far as the home language survey? Once they're in, what do we assess them with? And then where do they go along the plan? And then how do we reclassify them to get them out of um, support classes once they're at the point where their English is at the level that they can understand the core instruction in regular classrooms across the board? So in front of you, you have the master plan. I'm just going to touch on a few pages. We have approximately 225 ELs in our school system. I want to focus on page 12. Just on the bottom, we've gone through a lot of data today in our study session, but I just wanted to show you where it says LPAC scores. LPAC is the new English language proficiency assessment on the bottom of page 12. You'll see the 2017-18 uh, scores and you'll see the 2018-19 scores for our students. And what's significant about this particular chart, um, I'm not sure it's, it should be on the bottom of page right there. Go up right there. What's significant about this chart is when you look at the gray line, the gray line is the minimum for a student to hit level four. Level four is what a student needs to be considered for reclassification. That's one of the criterion. So you can see that the blue is what how our students did in reference to the language assessment uh, for um, 17, 18, and the orange is how they have done for 18, 19. So we're close. We have quite a few of our students that are getting up to that level. They're just not there to the level of four. I'm going to move on now. Uh, you've, you've reviewed this before. This is coming up to you, so you've seen this in years past. So I'd like to just now jump over to page number 24, if you can, Erica. And this has to do with the uh, EL roadmap. Uh, keep going down, Erica. You're going to see integrated ELD, and right after integrated ELD, there you go, principle one, principle two. This is what does the EL roadmap look like? If you go up a little further, Erica, you're going to see right there. The EL roadmap contains those four principles, one, two, three, and four, asset-oriented, um, realizing that somebody that comes with a second language, that's, that's an asset. And we would want all of our students to be bilingual, if not trilingual. And then the uh, making sure that they have rigorous uh, academic instruction and it's meaningful to them. And then our system conditions and how do we support their effectiveness. So all of those principles, what does that look like for us in St. Helena? And I just wanted to point that out so you have a chance to look at what does that look like. 
And then if I go down to page 26, uh, this just starts getting into what do we do at each one of our school sites, at the elementary school, the primary school, middle school, and the high school related to our EL. What are those supports that we provide at each one of our school sites? Beyond the designated and integrated EL, what else do we do to help support our students? And then the main point I wanted to get into tonight, uh, and definitely wanted the approval of the board, is what I've been doing with the master plan, EL master plan, has been refining it um, year after year. And last year, um, I looked at, and it wasn't last year, the year before, I looked at for our students that are in the SDC classrooms, the severely disabled uh, students that are in those classrooms, they were, they were they're classified as EL at the lower grades, and they continue to be EL at the high school level. And we didn't have an alternative assessment, so I we were able to, I was able to research, look around, and we developed an alternative assessment. So last year we were able to reclassify quite a few of those little guys at the high school uh, to not be considered an EL because that was not their primary condition of why they were there and we needed to have some other alternative assessment. The LPAC was not appropriate for them to be taking or the CELT. Uh, so that was my initial step. The step that's going to be happening this year is for our students that are in the mild to moderate classrooms or what we call um, resource classrooms. Again, we have dual diagnosis and I mean, uh, dual um, classifications. We have students that are classified as special ed. We have students that are classified as EL. That's great, and, and we are always going to have that. But if we've been doing support for many, many years, and there's, they started out with us in our system for six years, six to seven years, and we still see them as EL in sixth or seventh or eighth grade, we really need to start looking at what is happening here? Is it more of a learning and processing and special ed than it is a language acquisition because we've given them supports for six to seven years? So it, it really falls on the IEP team. And looking uh, with the IEP team and the EL coordinators at each one of the sites to look at the reclassification of those particular students so they're not continually going through and having to be tested with the LPAC when it's really not something that's appropriate for them at this point. They're considered an LTAL and what are we doing support wise? They have a goal in special ed uh, that might be a language goal um, and they're receiving services. So we've created uh, we being the special ed teachers and the EL, some reclassification criterion. They still need to uh, get a level four on the LPAC. However, when I called the state, the state said we can absolutely adjust that to a level three if the other criterion of their grades in their class, teacher recommendation, parent approval, and the IEP team approval states that yes, in fact, they should be reclassified, we can reclassify. Um, so that's what we'd like to do. We'd like to look at some of those students, not all of them, not every single student that has uh, the subclassifications of EL and, and um, special ed need to be reclassified, but we have a few that should because that is not the primary issue of why they should stay in EL. So that concludes, and I would love your approval on that. First of all, is there any public comment on this agenda item? Trustees, any questions or comments? I had one question, um, and I'm sh in the documentation and mm -hmm. that you uh, included on that. I noticed that there were a couple of forms. I saw some forms that were translated. Is it was that was just you just put a few in there for the sake of us right. to see them because I wanted to make sure all of them came in both languages. They do. Okay, they perfect. absolutely do. And the primary language we have in this in this community is Spanish. Correct. So all of our documentation is always in Spanish. I figured that, but I just in case anybody in you mm -hmm. know. I never, our viewing audience was paying attention as mm -hmm. well, so thank you. I just, um, I just wonder, I mean, this must be a, an issue throughout the state, throughout the country. Is there anything uh, that there is being considered at a state level to maybe create a, a different category of, of, um, uh, of special education, a different, a different classification? I mean, there, there can be, 
there can be maybe a combined classification that's tested in a different manner that's appropriate they you know what the lpac uh the online lpac has a lot of accommodations and modifications so you can there's absolutely a lot of ways that you can provide an el student support that's a special ed student but some students that are special ed that their disability is language uh it will never be the el um, classification that's holding them back. Um, so the state, they have four criteria. They have the parent approval, they have the LPAC, and for the LPAC they're creating a lot of accommodations and modifications and they keep m making more and more online. So I think it's a really pretty fair assessment as they get going and they'll refine it. Um, they're also coming up with a teacher assessment so it's fair across the board for teachers to actually do an observation and provide more feedback than yes they should they should be reclassified no they shouldn't so it'll really it'll really show is that student going to have success across the board if they're on other courses um, but the state realizes that that's why we have the alternative assessment for the SDC kids and that's why they're making accommodations and modifications on the LPAC for the kids that are mild to moderate and need those extra supports And I totally agree with you, Trustee Howard. It, it seems like there, this should be a statewide yeah. thing, not just, but I applaud going into it to the details and looking at it and saying, okay, six years, why? And then say, okay, well, maybe we're missing something or maybe we know something. And mm -hmm. so I, I think it's a great, mm -hmm. it's a great solution. Um, trustees, any other comments? I just want to thank you for the thorough report and all of the history behind the education and all the codes. I really appreciate that a lot. Thank you. So yeah, and I, um, I wasn't even really quite sure what it was that I was going to be approving tonight on this. And so thank you very much for, you know, I wasn't sure it was the reclassification criteria. I, I didn't know that. So, but it makes perfect sense. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I think for me as well, it's helpful to kind of see the whole process and the kind of the care and, and, and what, how you guys go into each student and, and have to determine all this, which I'm sure is challenging. Um, and I'm also happy to see that the L, the, the uh, roadmap is being utilized now in conjunction with the LCAP, and that's kind of driving that as well, since it's something that's newer. Thank, Thank you. you. Is there a motion to approve the 2019-2020 English Learner Master Plan as presented? I'll make that motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Joe, please cast your preferential vote. Aye. All the favors, please say aye. 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 Motion's carried. We're on to item number 9C, which is a presentation of the St. Helena Elementary School. Focus on equity. Ms. Tanya Pearson, please. Thank you. Thanks for this opportunity again to share about the school and, um, and whatnot. Um, yeah, striving for equity. So that it's our, it's our, it's so much work and our driving focus. Um, I like the image there. You can see just bicycles one size fit all does not suit um, people with special needs or or different heights or ages. Um, so just to be able to look to see what each person needs. Um, I'm really appreciative of having a small school site having planning time during our school day, having so much support for our teachers to be able to be professionals and to really, really, truly um, have those driving um, principles of all students succeeding and of all of us working at our professional best. It just, equity, I think, is the place where all of this comes together and it gets to be crystal clear of why that's so important. Um, so just as an umbrella and um, just a driving force, I've loved the state's focus as well, as well as other states that are focusing on this multi-tiered systems of support. Um, and thinking about prevention, that's like, what do we do preventatively? What do we do for every single student so that we're supporting their academic, social behavior, and their emotional needs for all? Um, that we're enriching or doing more for those that can and that already have a lot of those skills in place. It's not just a placeholder that here's our, here's our proficient bar and we're just gonna let people hover there, but that we're wanting to really know where is everybody starting and where are they finishing with growth as the, as the goal for every single person and to obviously intervene with more support when people need that. 
Um, it encompasses, as I said, all of those three pillars and really the engagement of our parent community, teamwork of our teachers, school community collaboration. I would highlight our Up Valley Family Center. They not only help us support our emotional needs with um, therapists that are licensed therapists, but also emotional needs and academic needs with our Up Valley family tutors that come in. Um, we're at about 25 or so again coming in every week, and I'm just astounded by the level of professional excellence that comes out of our community support as well. The curriculum design, and then um, we were mentioning a little bit about attendance being tied towards lower grades parents realizing what it takes to be successful in high school. Same thing all along this road is what are, we're not just looking at a fourth grade achievement. We're trying to develop people that are solid human beings that will be successful 35 year olds with careers and relationships and family dynamics and all of that. So as a person, what are we doing to support all of that? And then to get really granularly, our granular is more just for all students, um, the universal support, as I mentioned, for everybody, um, that that's based on the best practices that we know of and really trying to do those with as much fidelity as possible. Many trainings I've gone to have continued lately to just talk about not any magic bullet or something new that we need to do, but what is expected as good practices, how well are we doing them, and how much better can we do and stay true to the best supports for academic, emotional, and the, and the behavioral support? And then some students, about 15% or so, um, everybody still gets the main um, meat of what we're trying to do, but some will get some supplemental support. And then a few, you know, one to 5% will get that really extra targeted support. Um, and one of the goals is that is that we always assess the needs of students and the best qualified people are working to support the highest need students. Um, so whether that be our special ed teachers or teachers in our classrooms working with the highest need kids with enrichment and our push and support or paraprofessionals are working with more of the mainstream kind of middle of the ground um, rather than some of the higher need people, um, which has happened in the past. So really getting critical, who are, who are our customers as students? What are their needs? And who are the best people and the best systems to deliver the support? And I'm gonna look into the three prongs there being the academic, the social behavioral, as I said, or social emotional and behavioral. Um, and within that, how are we assessing and how are we supporting on each of those three things? Um, when we've done some, um, anyway, when we do some of our needs assessment, we're realizing that we've been very strong in the data that we've been collecting for academics. So the assessment for data, really, this is nothing new, um, but it is super important that we continue to do it, that we have really solid standards-based instruction. We're really frequently using formative assessment and as much as possible that's universally um, adopted by all of the classrooms. Our goal is that all teachers are seeing all the students as theirs, not just competing or trying to be kind of like a little microcosm, um, that they're sharing the best practices, but also understanding how everybody is doing. The small class sizes helps so much. It really is really very positive for that. Um, and then that the universal grade level, kind of the whole year long academic plan um, is agreed upon and the attention and support is targeting the standards that, um, that really are uh, foundational skills. They're enduring skills that we look at that maybe from one year to the next are gonna need to be really put in place and they're things that might integrate with other subject areas. So um, we really, those are the things that we're really fine tuning and targeting to try to get to 100% understanding, 100% proficiency for the best, most essential standards. Um, also that our benchmark assessment there, bullet number three, those, um, those are done like the map assessment, the student um, reading inventory are done at the very beginning of the year. So we get like a, I'd say kind of like that litmus test of where students are starting with us so that we can see growth for the individual student and we see their individual needs. So again, that we're not just giving a one size fits all instruction. We're not just focusing on what we're teaching, but our focus is on what needs to be learned by what student in what way. And that can be really pretty unique. 
Um, it's not 21 curriculums if there's 21 kids, so we do try to group like needs with each other, um, you know, so within reason, um, but, but we're really strategic about that, and I've been very proud of the work that we're doing. Um, that number four, that the frequent instructional assessment results, the results are analyzed by the teams. Um, that's been an area of growth. There, 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 there's some level of discomfort at times when things haven't worked well. And over the years, we've got so much more transparent where people just are like, look at this. Well, they celebrate when they can, but then like, what happened here? What did you do? How did you do that? Oh my God. You know, so just the more they're working together and that they're actually focusing on real learning and results, it's really, it's just been like a snowball of effect that's been really positive in that way. Um, we have some of our results. We have, well, we have um, data tables, but we're talking about putting them up on the wall so that we can see samples of what the, the targeted achievement should look like and that all the grade levels can notice the third, fourth, and fifth grade pro progression and hopefully work with that visibly around us while we're working in our teams as well. And then that intervention and enrichment happens before, during, and after school. Um, we've been doing well with the before and after school, and this year um, we now have all our grade levels trying to work more with like doing that intervention in the moment during that week. So in math, for example, on, on Fridays there's more of a spiral review or enrichment and a targeted intervention during the school day. Um, and that is so that there's access and equitable for everybody, not just those that get to school early or can stay later. We need to have it happen within the hours of the school day as much as possible so that we're working on that. We'll always have the extras like enrichment classes and whatnot, but talking about doing more clubs and um, different kind of curriculum that will help the high end as well as the lower end as well. And then the data in this next two pieces has been uh, positive new steps that we've been taking. Um, so you can see the social emotional learning there on the circle there. You see those areas that we're focusing on with social awareness, the relationship skills, the self-awareness, responsible decision making and self-management. And that universal screener. Um, those are based on teacher observations. It's not students or parents at this point at least completing them, but in the fall we've completed them. The counselor, as I've mentioned in our last meeting, um, reviewed those, gave results to the teams, and now this new screener for this year includes those suggested support, games, books, resources and that have been adopted. Um, our counselor also is meeting with teams as they identify needs. So that third bullet there, we're working with second step curriculum, which we've always done. Um, but this year we're noticing where are some of those holes, where are the strongest parts of it, and we've been bolstering it now with our program, mainly looking at better ways of students understanding their own emotions, learning the tips so that they can self-regulate and not just how they're interacting with others. So we're putting that personal piece more strategically in place at every single classroom. Um, there's protocols that we've developed on how people use certain steps and kits. And then we've got a tool where um, resources are suggested based on targeted needs. Uh, fourth grade, for example, there's a little bit of some um, relationship where maybe certain students want to exclude others, um, you know, cross gender, both gender or all genders really. Um, so they're working on some games, some ways of like using certain kind of common books and common videos and identifying that ahead of time so that everybody can do that. And then there will be some little kind of focus groups for those that need a little extra dose of it. Uh, so looking at the highest breakdowns and how do we support them ahead of time and during the process of improving. The calm down corners, as I said, also with universal protocols on how to use them. In the beginning, there's a little more high interest, so a little heavy use, but as it goes on, the kids just use them when they need it. So that's, that's the goal as well. Um, we've also got some standard, it just even as simple as the same calm down chair in every single classroom, the same posters, the same charts. So if classrooms are, say, integrating where they're combining kids or working across grade levels, those students will recognize it in any classroom, any specialist um, office, even in our own office, we've got those similar supports for them as well. Check in, check out, as I said, th that would be more of a level two, a tier two or tier three support for the higher need students. And then the most intense would be um, long-term counseling and support targeting those certain goals as well. And then third, for our behavioral assessment and support, um, last year I conducted a PBIS uh, fidelity inventory 
and also noticed that there were certain things that we had done well, but one thing that we really needed was more data collection and making decisions based on actual data and facts and being able to notice how our positive intentions were actually affecting the student achievement in terms of their behavior. Um, so we've been working to do um, more school-wide goals and then also monitoring um, cafeteria behavior. For example, we had a team work together to figure out some better ways to do seating. They work towards points. Um, they have the poster posted up there. They've all done some common like understanding. And I've grounded it really on empathy and teamwork and that they're a team with our custodial staff. Um, I've got a microphone in there and I introduce them like with great fanfare. We've got Michael Brewer and Orlando Bulgarine coming in. Let's clean the floor and clean the table. You know, it just like builds that like reason for working together as a team and doing stuff to improve our school. Um, so that's the second point, just building that community, empathy, helping everyone understand that they're part of a larger group and that their success and success of others goes in tandem together. Um, and then the whole school, um, the B rule, so be safe, responsible, and respectful. We look at what that looks like as a whole school at the classroom level, and teachers are able to use the same kind of language that we're using across all the classrooms. Then restorative practices, um, and really I will say this year as well, um, trauma-informed practices. Those are two pillars that we're really, um, or two practices that we're working to better understand across every classroom. Um, there are some teachers who maybe understood those better or used them in different ways, but we've done some systematic work with um, anything from understanding certain restorative questions, like what happened, who was affected by what you did, how do you think they're feeling now, what could you have done differently, how can you fix what happened, make a plan for that. And then there's some guidelines so um, students understand how to make a, a really thoughtful apology if they need to. They learn in some way from their mistake with a contract and then they actually do a project or an activity with the goal that they would either help fix something or help future people um, learn from their mistakes in some way. We had a great, I won't say any names, but a really great third grade issue where um, a student made an, um, like a video that was able to be shared with his classmates and they felt he felt really proud and his classmates like brought him back in in a really supportive way. So I really love seeing that. Um, and again, that is um, with trauma-informed practices, we're looking at trying to shift from look at what this person did to why did this happen, what might they be going through, how can we support them so that they learn and that they're able to get into that more general population of not needing that level of extra support and structure. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Is there any public comment? Trustees, any questions or comments? Um, just good stuff that's going on. That's great. Um, I had one question regarding the universal screeners that are done in the fall and then review. Is there a subsequent spring like check in or a reassessment, if you will, that are up are up that will be updated? You know, we okay. didn't do that last year. We just did it in the fall, and okay. we have only conducted in the fall. But okay. that's an excellent point, because okay. it would be great to see that we've got some movement and what the data looks like okay, at the great. beginning and the end. Okay, mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else? Um, my my comment is thank you very much for sharing all of this information with what you're doing at your, at your site. And um, this is great. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks. you. I just had a quick question. Is that a uh, calm down corner? Is that similar to the calm down kit or is that? Mm -hmm. Oh, it is? Okay. Yeah, it's similar. And um, what's interesting where it's, um, so one thing, for example, I think it's out of Yale or there's somewhere that researched like how to color code co um, cool and hot emotions, for example, and put them into colored grids. At the primary school, there's some simple kind of happy, sad, mad, um, I forget the other one. Um, and um, my son, for example, saw that, I had it open, there was a chart, and then he's like, oh, we have that angry, mad, sad. And then at our level, they're flushed out to about seven different similar, but maybe it's disappointed or um, frustrated or so kind of like teasing out a little nuanced. Um, and then as adults, we actually had a retreat based on some of this. And we looked at like for adults, what that actually can look like and, and like how you feel, why and how you feel frustrated. There's a little different 
personal response that you could take to fix that or to understand it better. So it builds on what the primary school is doing intentionally. Great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think you're actually giving Mr. Farrell an idea in his classroom. I can see that spinning over there. At least. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we are on to item uh, 9D, which is presentation of Robert Louis Stevenson, focus on equity. Ms. Corinne Cox, please. Thank you. I'm sure you guys will be delighted to get to hear another report on equity. It's because of the fires. Tanya was supposed to go in October, so I will um, keep it very succinct. Um, something you're familiar with, the difference between equity and equality, and what does fair really means, which is um, every it isn't everybody getting the same thing, but everybody getting what they need in order to be successful. So uh, just a different viewpoint. And I um, set this up a little bit differently because I knew that Tanya was going to cover a, a lot of detail. So mine is uh, um, not repeating the same ground, hopefully. <laughs> um, it just is referencing the academics, behavior, social, emotional, MTSS. And then I just listed some of the things that we're doing and I'm happy to take questions. I'll go over a couple of them. Uh, honestly, most of the things that we're doing in, in these areas are not necessarily anything new. I think MTSS is just a more intentional focused way of looking at the things that already really mattered to us and that our school has spent a lot of time on over a lot of years. It just is a more organized systematic way of looking at it. So in academics, um, those are the m many of the programs I've discussed and told you guys about in the past and including earlier today, uh, such as the math essentials class, um, having um, um, integrated ELD in all the classes, plus the new newcomer ELD class and core support, um, also enrichment and our MTSS paraprofessionals and learning center. It's a variety of things that we're doing from kids with um, in the very high needs to kids who need enrichment. Um, in terms of behavior, uh, this is an area I think that RLS was really ahead of the curve um, on this part um, due to the work that Mary Allen put in a long time ago along with Terry O'Leary. We already had a lot of the programs that support the equity part of MTSS such as Safe School Ambassadors. Um, we already had the web program. Uh, some of the PBIS is something that RLS has had for a long time and it's now in the entire district. Some of the things that we've added um, in is um, the school resource officer is new, campus supervisor, we've had this as our third year, fourth year, fourth year of a campus supervisor. Um, and we've added a behavior intervention team um, just in the last less than a year. The behavior intervention team consists of our campus supervisor, Terry O'Leary, the counselor, myself, and Dana Sabin, who's the behavior specialist for the district. And we meet every other week, and we have an ongoing Google Doc with um, students that are on our watch list. And we're really trying to um, be proactive and identify what are concerns that this student is having and what are some things that we can do to address those concerns early and how can we track that and try and prevent this student from getting suspended or missing class time or having other issues. And so we really work to think involving other specialists as needed, including Up Valley therapists, um, getting teachers involved, and then as we um, notice that we aren't needing, that the child's not coming up anymore, we keep them on the list, but they get dropped down to the bottom so that we remember, just to remember that they're there and also as kind of a, yay, look at that, they're still down there at the bottom and we aren't having to deal with them anymore. So it's nice to see that you take a child who we think, wow, this is not going well and offer them the kind of supports they needed so that they, can become a non-issue. That's the goal. Doesn't always work, but we try. Um, and under social emotional, this is an area that the entire district, I think, is incredibly strong at and is one of the things actually that I appreciate most about this district is all of the resources that the board um, supports so that we can really offer kids the kind of um, support that they need, both in mental health and just in general life, how to function as a human being. So having a full-time school counselor, I 
cannot even tell you how important that is. There just are no words. It's incredible, especially somebody um, like Terry O'Leary, who is so um, engaged with students and so involved in, in every aspect. And because we don't have the college piece of it, she can really focus all of it on the counseling piece of it, which is great. The Up Valley Family Center therapists, um, we've had family groups for a, a number of years now. Uh, so that the students have that same um, family situation that lasts for all three years. Web has been happening since before I was there. We have Aldea, which comes and does um, uh, groups on stu targeted groups on students, depending on what their needs are in the area of alcohol and drug use. So whether it's if they have a family member who's using, if they're curious, if they're using themselves, if they think they have a problem, or if they are just wanting more information, they have separate groups so that they can meet the needs of kids in each of those different areas. Um, we have Claire and Claro um, for our Hispan Hispanic students. Mentis, which is another counseling service. They do group sessions. Um, Teen Connect is a wellness cafe. And then we have student recognition programs in that area as well. And a promise to keep it succinct. So <laughs> any questions on anything specific on my presentation? First of all, is there any public comment? Trustees, any questions or comments? Um, the services you were just mentioning with um, Aldeo and Aldea and Mentis, are those um, students opt in or are they like asked to join? Students opt in. So they, uh, to be in Aldea, they, we actually had 90 kids or some huge number like that, that, um, want, that showed an interest in Aldea and then they create groups based on that. Uh, Mentis is more of a, uh, we, opt you in but you have to opt in as well but that's my more uh us suggesting that that might be a good placement great thank you question anybody else and are there still other counselors in the office as well um licensed therapists so to speak yeah so in addition to to terry o'leary we also have uh three up valley therapists one okay. of whom is bilingual okay Thank goodness, because that was really challenging to, uh, after Max's, um, Max Hernandez passed away right. to find somebody who was bilingual. So we do have somebody now. And then we also have Eric Erickson and, um, and Sarah Forney, okay. who've been there for a long time yeah. and do an amazing job. Great. Yeah. Thank you. That's okay. good stuff. Thank you so much. You Appreciate bet. it. We are on to item 9E, which is consideration approval for 2019-2020 uh, LCAP site strategic plans. Mr. Chris Heller, please. Yes, and um, well, I mean, we've talked about the strategic plans plenty this afternoon in our uh, study session. And uh, again, just to recap for uh, anybody who was not able to listen earlier, our site strategic plans are based on our California dashboard indicators that will drive the actions at each site to support the overall local control accountability plan. Uh, the principals presented um, three highlights uh, during our study session that shared you know, the vision of their plan and the scope of work that the, they will be doing at their sites. So um, I would ask that the board uh, entertain a motion to approve these plans moving forward for the rest of the 2019-2020 school year. Is there anyone who wishes to publicly comment on this agenda item? Trustees, any questions or comments? Just uh, thank you for wonderful reports because whether or not anybody, there's multiple pages on these reports and so I know it's time consuming. So thank you very much for your all the great effort. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve the 2019-2020 LCAP site strategic plans as presented? I'll make a motion to approve. Is there a second? I'll second. Uh, Joe, please cast your preferential vote. Aye. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion's carried. We're on to item number 9F, which is a written report on the St. Helena Unified School District Emergency Preparedness Plan. Uh, is there anyone who wishes to publicly comment on this agenda item? Trustees, any questions or comments? No, I just want to say thank you for all the work on this too. I mean, this is, there's, um, I know it's always changing 
a changing scenario with this one. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Thank you. I just want to um, say that um, uh, considering the tragedy of today, that it's more and more important that we always have something in place that we, we can go to because it, you just never know what can happen. And um, the best safety for our students is a well-prepared plan. And I think we really owe it to our uh, administration to that they're always on top of all the new developments. Every, every new thing that we have to consider right. is always um, taken into account. Thank you. Well said. On to item number 10, human resources, consideration of approval for revised certificated substitute salary schedule. Mr. Chris Heller, please. Yes, uh, this may look familiar as an agenda item because it surfaced last year when we brought forth a, a proposal to increase substitute salaries in, in August of 2018. And um, as we've noticed, uh, other districts have increased their compensation for substitutes and we've just uh, approved a, a new certificated bargaining agreement and we felt that it would be appropriate uh, for us to increase the substitute salaries to the amounts that you see on the uh, the screen there to uh, retract uh, attract and retain uh, substitute teachers when our, our regular staff is unable to attend. Uh, Andy has worked the costs and estimates it's going to be approximately um, around $20,000 an additional increase, but uh, we'll have that factored into the first interim next month. So uh, it shouldn't be a um, huge financial burden to us, but it is something that we believe we need to do and approve uh, to continue to attract substitutes to our district. Is there any public comment? Trustees, any questions or comments? Just one question, because I noticed it said K through 12. We have a TK, so does that, does that include TK? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. We'll, we'll, we'll amend that. Okay. Yeah. Thank okay. you for the. Thanks. Is there a motion to approve the revised certificated substitute salary schedule as presented? I'll make that motion. Is there a second? I'll second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion's carried. We're on to 10B, which is review and request uh, for approval of AB 1200, public disclosure documents associated with tentative agreement between CSEA Chapter 287 and St. Helena Unified School District. Ms. Sandy Stubbs. Thank you. And these would be the uh, required public disclosure documents that you've seen before. We did this with SHTA back in August. Uh, and so now that we were looking at a, a tentative agreement with CSEA, the board is asked to consider approval of these public disclosure documents for CSEA also. And they do include a multi-year projection, uh, which was based on the last budget report, which was our original budget in June. Uh, and so you do see some deficit spending as a result of these increases but I'll be bringing a first interim report to you next month that will, um, I anticipate, will have some of that deficit spending mitigated. Is there anyone who wishes to publicly comment on this agenda item? Trustees, any questions or comments concerning this item? No. Is there a motion to approve AB 1200 public disclosure documents associated with tentative agreement between CSEA Chapter 287 and St. Helena Unified School District? I'll make that motion. Is there a second? I'll second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion is carried. We're on to review and request for approval of AB 1200 public disclosure documents associated with districts certificated classified management and confidential employee groups. Ms. Andy Stubbs. Thank you. And these would be the same required uh, documents for those groups as well. And so when you look at the multi-year projection uh, in these reports, then you see kind of the compilation of all the different bargaining units from SHTA all the way through our unrepresented groups. And none of these increases are applied to uh, executive cabinet level salaries. So it's all non-executive cabinet level. Is there any public comment on this agenda item? Trustees, any questions or comments? No. Is there a motion to approve the AB 1200 public disclosure documents associated with districts certificated classified management and confidential employee groups? I'll make that motion. Is there a second? I'll second. All those in favor say aye. 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 
Motion carries. We're on to 10D, which is approval of salary schedules for all non-executive cabinet level positions, 2019-20 through 21-22. Miss Andy Stubbs, please. And indeed, the salary schedules that are included here reflect all the changes that the board has now uh, approved over the three years. Okay. Is there any public comment on this agenda item? Trustees, any questions or comments? No. Is there a motion to approve the salary schedules for all non-executive cabinet level positions? I'll make a motion to approve. Is there a second? A second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion is carried. We're on to item number 11, which is consent agenda. Um, is there anyone who wish to pull an item from the consent agenda? Uh, yes, I'd like to pull item F. 11F? Yes. Okay. Any others? Is there anyone who wishes to publicly comment on all items on the consent agenda with the exception of 11F? Trustees, any questions or comments for any item on the consent agenda with the exception of 11F? Um, no. I think no, I don't. Okay. Uh, is there a motion to, uh, to approve the consent agenda for everything except for item 11F? I'll make the motion. Is there a second? I'll second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion is carried. Okay, we are on to item 11F, which is review and consider approval of a memorandum of understanding between St. Helena uh, Preschool for All Incorporated and St. Helena Unified School District. So is there a comment? What would somebody like to know? Go ahead. So I would like to recuse myself on the item. I'm okay. the executive director of St. Helena Preschool for All. Okay. And I'm going to recuse myself also because I'm the treasurer. Okay. It's down to us. Okay. <laughs> Is there any public comment on item 11F? Trustees, any questions or comments on item 11F? Okay. Is there a motion to approve item 11F? I'll make a motion to approve. Is there a second? I will second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries 3-0. We are on to item number 12A, which is request for approval of contracts over 25,000. Ms. Andy Stubbs. Thank you. And we have three for your consideration this evening. The first is with Consolidated Networks. Uh, you may recall some time ago the board approved contracts for us to move from AT&T to Sonic for our network cabling. Uh, and so we're going to be realizing a lot of savings over the next 10 years from that switch. Uh, however, we need to use some Measure B, Measure C bond proceeds uh, to support that work because it's some very complex work to change over uh, ISP addresses and things like that. And so uh, the board is asked to approve that contract with Consolidated Networks for um, assisting our IT team with that over the summer. Uh, and then the next would be for a uh, student or students attending a non-public school placement through uh, our special education services. Uh, and that's a, a recent placement. And then finally, uh, we have still some uh, old copiers across the district and, uh, that we own. And uh, this would be kind of the last two that probably need to be replaced, I think, this year. Uh, and so we're entering into some lease agreements for these copiers. And then we'll evaluate at the end of the five-year lease and determine if we want to pay for them cash out or replace them with new machines. Is there anyone who wishes to publicly comment on this agenda item? Trustees, any questions or comments uh, concerning the contracts over 25000 no. Is there a motion to approve the contracts over 25000 I'll make that motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Joe, please cast your preferential vote. Aye. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion is carried. We are on to item number 13, communications, superintendent subcommittee reports. LCAP uh, was Thursday, October 17th. Um, who's going to speak about that, Jeannie or... We didn't discuss who would speak, but I, I'm happy to. Okay, go ahead. Uh, okay. So um, uh, the LCAP, of course, we um, we have spent the whole day uh, hearing from our our um, 
site uh, administrators, and um, basically we were looking at um, the site plans as well as the equity question. Um, and everything's pretty much been covered today uh, as, um, uh, that was covered. So I, I think we were the dry run, I guess, for, <laughs> for, the, for the presentations that we've heard today. And I just want to say that it is an awful lot of work. It's an awful lot of um, uh, data gathering. It's an awful lot of writing. It's an awful lot of um, thought and, and effort put into all of these. Um, the the uh, just the formats of getting everything put together. I don't know if Jeannie wants to add anything. I mean, the one thing that um, we are um, we'll have a, a student um, circle, I guess is what it's oh, called. Oh yeah, that's So right. there was a um, a subcommittee that was going to be meeting um, in October, but it was canceled because of the of the fire situation um, th with the school closure. But what it is is where we'll um, look at a, a bank of survey questions and kind of put together a survey that, or the questions that the that we'll ask the students. In the, is that is that correct, Mr. Heller? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Okay. It will be in November. Okay. Lovely. Thank you. Uh, the next is equity, climate, and culture, which uh, met on Wednesday, October twenty third. Would you like to do that one, and then I'll do my the wellness? <laughs> there you go. Okay. So. Let's see, that was our first meeting of the year. Uh, we reviewed the mission vision statement and we went over last year's uh, final meeting notes just to kind of see what what was voted on at then and then to kind of see what we could put in place. Uh, we watched a really good video about inclusion and in education, which was, I think everyone, if you get an opportunity, I think Mary Ellen can share that with, with the board if, if you guys would be interested. Um, and then we had uh, a few updates. One was the LBGTQ update. Originally, we had talked about having someone come out to speak to our community. And so we discussed as a as a group and decided that may, we were going to have them maybe come to our committee meeting first and talk to our committee before moving forward with that, just to kind of discuss what we want to see in the presentation. And then we just um, we reviewed some of the multicultural activities that we have in place currently and then kind of discuss and brain, brainstorm some of the changes that we may want to see in the future. And we had a few uh, new committee members, which was exciting just to get people with different um, experiences, backgrounds, and just get some new ideas. So we were excited to see some new members to that committee. Great. Enthusiasm. Good. Uh, the last uh, committee that met was wellness on Monday, November 7th. Uh, yes, which was another well attended um, uh, committee. It would be nice to see a few, some more parents on that, I think, but perhaps it just didn't work for schedules this time. But that would be great if uh, anybody's listening. Would like, we would love to have you on that committee. Um, basically, we reviewed the vision and mission, mission statements as well, went over the purpose of the wellness committee. Um, oh, thank, thank you. I guess because I always assume I'm just so loud anyway. <laughs> um, um, yes, and then uh, Andy leads us in those meetings. And we just kind of went over the, the student support team members at each campus. Um, but the primary crux of the wellness committee is to focus on a couple of issues, um, both for students and staff. And um, it's basically wellness for both of those groups. Um, for students, it's going to be a continuation of focusing on the vaping epidemic and prevention and education. And and then for sure, mental health, uh, you know, the all the anxiety that students are feeling, the, the pressures, the just the overwhelmness of, of their life in school. And then also focusing on our staff with the theme being that you, we need to have healthy, well-balanced teachers in front of our children. And so um, our district is ha is offering some things to our staff coming up, whether um, it's the main maintain, not gain, and then a partner. Starts tomorrow. Which starts tomorrow. After our big dinner tonight. Um, and then a partnership with St. Helena Fitness as well, uh, a six-week program coming up in January. So um, it's, it's great. Plus, we always get a, a taste test of Angela Baxter's great food. So that's a perk of that committee as well. <laughs> Anything else, Maria? I think I uh, wanted to mention uh, it was brought up by a parent that um, that what was very um, 
astute in saying that uh, we have the vaping epidemic. We're looking at a lot of different angles of of um, addressing it, and she brought out the importance of actually um, bringing cessation programs in for the kids that are already addicted, and um, and that was something that was um, that was a good outcome of uh, a good point that needs to be addressed as well because uh, it's just it's one more thing to think about. Okay. So that uh, covers the superintendent subcommittee reports. Uh, St. Lena Teachers Association report to the board. Mr. Brandon Farrell, please. President. Good evening. Uh, thank you for catching me smirking earlier, Mr. Conwell. <laughs> the, um, I wasn't quite smirking at something I was going to do in my class. It was more about <laughs> what I remembered of what the calm down corner was like when I was in school. I, <laughs> that's where I was too. <laughs> necessarily the same. The breathing apparatus wasn't included over there that Miss Sanguinetti has. <laughs> um, no, uh, the only thing I'd like to, to talk about tonight is yesterday I did have uh, some time to go and speak with all of our new teachers and check in with them. And it was a really, uh, and I, I saw some other teachers as well. Some other programs got to say hi to the band and RLS. That was pretty nice because there's uh, there's quite a few of them and I'm hoping they, they continue. Uh, but the teachers that are new to our district uh, are feeling really, really positive about their experience so far. Uh, they feel tremendously supported and they are just, you know, head over heels uh, amazed about what, you know, the number of supports and, and resources that they have. So. It's been a really good fit for, you know, I think there's 12 of them, right, Mr. Heller? 12, 13, 11, something like that. And it's been a, it, it's been a very positive vibe all through the district in all four sites. And I have to hand it to all the staff and the leadership and all of the, the different uh, things that were in place to help them out. So I'm, I was really pleased to hear that. So that's all I have. Thank you very much. Always like to hear that. Uh, item 13 uh, C, which is the California School Employees Association uh, CSEA 287 report to the board, is a written report. So, trustees, please review that if you've not already. And, uh, public, it's still there for you. So, item 13, which is acting superintendent, well, Sandy thank, Stubbs. Thank you very much. And I do have a couple of items this evening. Uh, District of Choice applications are due December 2nd, 2019. Uh, and then we talked about emergency preparedness a little bit earlier this evening. And so we do have a town hall meeting scheduled for December 10th uh, from 5.30 to 7 o'clock. And we will be uh, announcing uh, that location and more information about that to our parent community. And that will be a helpful venue for parents to uh, ask questions and we can address concerns and so forth. Uh, and then finally, I do want to remind the community that we do have a green initiative resolution which addresses conservation, uh, which was written by a student and two board members some time ago. And uh, we are working on a revised version of that, which will be brought to the board at an upcoming board meeting, likely in February or March, uh, to potentially also address climate change, either within that resolution or possibly as a separate resolution. And I assume that's going to go through the policy committee and then work itself to the board. So, okay. Absolutely, yes. Thank you very much. That takes us to item number 14, future agenda items. There's only 14 of them, so we're doing pretty good for next next month. How, how are the trustees feeling? Do you have anything you'd like to add to this list? No, this is good. I just, um, I, one other item that um, is being discussed, it's not going to be on the next, uh, well, it's going to be next spring. We're, we're looking at um, also the other, um, the other resolution that we're working on. Um, if Joe, do you want to discuss that? Yeah, so um, I recently met with Trustee Pelosi and Trustee Haug to um, kind of jumpstart 
our action to reevaluate the green initiative. And then within that, we also talked about um, passing a formal resolution to acknowledge June as Pride Month while also flying the Pride flag out on the district flagpole. Um, we noticed that uh, other school districts within the county passed similar resolutions last year. Um, unfortunately, we were a little late just evaluating our flag code um, and drafting a resolution. So we are also looking to do that um, and meeting with students to help uh, draft that resolution. Okay. And I believe those are all scheduled in the, in the, in the, spring. the, in the spring time. Yes. Okay. So nothing for next month. Okay. Just want to confirm. Um, that takes us to item number 15 for adjournment. I'll make a moment, a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? I'll second. All those in favor say aye. 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 The meeting is adjourned at time 729. Thank you very much. Earlier than I thought. And you didn't think 